Okay, thank you very much for being here today. I'm Alberto Massida. I speak on behalf of SourceSense. Today, we'll be talking uh, about machine translation, how we can teach computers to read and write, how we can teach language. We'll be talking about uh, past, so how we did things uh, in the past and uh, how we are doing things today. We will be uh, covering up extensively uh, the old school methods in, by which uh, uh, the big, uh, the like of Google, delivered uh, their first uh, industry ready machine translation, and uh, how then things changed. And uh, the shift of paradigm was really, really impressive. Uh, everything changed, and nothing is basically backward compatible with what, what it was once. So that's why it's a dramatic turn of paradigm. So who we are, a brief presentation, we are SourceSense, we are a consulting company, and we focus on open source uh, software. We just use open source software to deliver enterprise-ready solutions. We have uh, been existing for, for 17 years. Uh, we have uh, branches in Milan, Rome, and London. We are experts at open source uh, DevOps. Uh, we build the public and private clouds. We are also have an edge uh, in data management, like uh, information retrieval, search engines, uh, uh, data crunching uh, like Spark and so on, and more things also. We also do system integrations. We are also coders, not only system engineers. Of course, this presentation is open source, uh, and uh, you can uh, really take all these materials and tweak as you want to distribute uh, and do whatever you want. So the outline for today's presentation, we'll, we'll be starting with statistical machine translation, how things were done in the past uh, when uh, 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 this field was basically for PhD people, statisticians. There were uh, probability laws, uh, there were uh, fraction counting, marginal probability. Uh, I'll try to keep the math uh, as high as possible. Uh, we will be running into maybe some formulas, but don't be scared, I'll be really, really clear about it. Then, how uh, things shifted to our neural machine translation. Then, we'll be talking about very three advanced uh, topics, which is domain adaptation, when you want uh, your machine to adapt some style. So, for example, you want it to talk legalese, or maybe you want it to adopt uh, social scientist politics terms. Then, the zero shot translation, which is uh, how we can translate unknown languages, uh, for which we don't have even training data. And then the unsupervised neural and machine translation, how we can really get it to work uh, even without human supervision during the training. So statistical machine translation looks at the problem of translating as a ciphering war, secret messages going from submarines in the German army and uh, people had to recover the encrypted message in order to save uh, the lives of uh, a lot of soldiers. And uh, the same ideas were implemented uh, to uh, a, a message in a language which I don't know. It's basically, it's basically a ciphered message, you know? It's like uh, I turn into a, something which is unreadable, it's not understandable to me, I cannot consume it. And what if I can uh, recover back the message through probability laws? So, this, uh, uh, this problem is tackled by the, the foundational work of this uh, was established by Claude Shannon in the theory of information. And it treats the foreign language as a noisy channel. Then we'll be introducing the concept of language model and translation model. So how we can uh, really build uh, a foundation of how language is really turned into. Then how we build the system actually, we train it, and how we use it to decode. So the goal is to translate a sentence in a foreign language, F, to our language, E. This is because it is basically French to English. Uh, it's a tradition that our language is E. Uh, I will not override this convention in this presentation. So when we, went, when we have a sentence F, and we have a lot of possible sentences in, uh, in our language, English, and each one has a probability to be the right one for this message we don't know the content about. What is the sentence who gets the maximum probability, argmax? So it takes, we take the, the sentence which maximizes the probability, and that's our sentence. In Bayesian terms, it means uh, what is the sentence that, uh, given the, the original message, uh, had the best chance to be the one who generated the, the encrypted message? It's a backward model. 
So the abstract model is that we transmit E, the original sentence, over a noisy channel. The channel garbles the sentence, and F is received. This message that we don't know. We try to recover E by thinking about how likely is that E was the message, which is the probability that E was said at all. This is the source model. It's something to do with our language. What is the characteristics of our, our language, our own, that we, we, we understand? And then how F is turned into E, which is P, the probability of having the sentence E, given the fact that we observed the, um, the sentence F, which is the channel model. It uh, models how things get turned into. So this, this, these two models uh, take care of word choice, so we pick the right words, and we reorder them. So PFE cares about, word, uh, about words in any order. So it's too late, uh, may become uh, uh, troppo tardi, which is the proper way of saying that in Italian. And, uh, but also it can be troppo tardi è, so I uh, reversed the, the order. Uh, doesn't make sense, it looks like Yoda of Star Wars may speak like that. But then we go also, it's too late, uh, which uh, I uh, wrongly can be translated like e troppa birra, it's too much beer. Uh, the, the words are wrong, so this model discriminates uh, the word choice. Then we got this PE that cares about words order, so troppo tardi è or e troppo tardi, e troppo tardi is the right one for the model, because this model validates the language model if uh, our w uh, sentence is likely to appear in our language. So, P and PFE, right, but where these numbers, where these probabilities come from? How do you uh, really calculate that? Well, the language model comes from a, uh, a machine that assigns scores to sentences. And the, it, the, it estimates the likelihood that a sentence is ever produced. That's my timer. Okay. So, if the sentence, uh, how is it going, uh, appears uh, uh, sometimes uh, in a corpus of sentences that I have recorded, uh, like uh, I get it one billion sentences, and how is it going, appears uh, 76, four time, 76 thousand times. Uh, so, the probability of how is it going uh, is exactly 76 uh, uh, thousand times over 10 to the power of 9, which is that very small number. Okay, it may appear as a very small, so very unlikely, but actually, if you think about that, uh, it's uh, recurring uh, a lot of times during uh, um, our mo uh, corpus. Instead, the flower day medal of doesn't get any score because it's a sentence that we never ever experienced to see in real English. Then we got a translation model. Uh, it worries about uh, the probability of a French string given an English string E. How likely uh, is to be turned into that? Uh, this is called translation model, and it boils down to computing alignments between source and target language. So the intuition between, uh, uh, in um, computing links between words uh, is actually that uh, the pairs of English and uh, words in other languages, like Chinese, I don't, even, I don't know Chinese, I cannot really say anything about Chinese, but everybody here can see that uh, words that come together in a parallel example may be the translation of each other. Do you know what is the meaning of this glyph here? Shrimp, Shrimp. exactly. How do you know that? Because it occurs every time. Also here occurs every time. So this probably is, it, it, it may be, it may not be as well, but the chance is really high that that is exact translation. So this is the intuition. We then arm ourselves with the training data as much as we can. Uh, it's called the parallel corpus. It's a, co it's a collection of texts. Each one is the translation of the other. So look at that, uh, guarda la, I never see anything like that, and so on. And uh, you can see that that usually uh, can occur with the e, which is the word is uh, in, in Italian. Then we use an algorithm which uh, uh, is called expectation maximization. And uh, this algorithm iterates over data over, 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 and again until convergence. So it stops by itself and uh, exacerbates latent properties of the system. And it finds a local uh, point of convergence when they say, okay, it's good enough. We do an example with a very, very small corpus. If we have uh, uh, two sentences with four symbols, BC translates to XY. Uh, also, B translates to Y. Can you tell me what is the translation of C? X. So C probably aligns with the symbol X, and B aligns with the symbol uh, Y, because we count how many times B appears uh, 
in, cor in correspondence with y, and then we do a marginal count about uh, how much, uh, uh, how many times, and we, this turns into probabilities. Probability is just uh, nine out of ten. Ninety percent of probability is just the fact that on ten observation, nine times over ten, I saw that. I can see that over two times, uh, all all my observation is uh, two uh, lines. Uh, I can see the b twice aligned with uh, y, and since the probability must sum up to one. Uh, the certain probability, which is certain in this case, uh, that B aligns to Y, leaves us uh, with no other chance that C aligns to X. Now it's time to decode our string, which is encrypted, it's a ciphered message. We can decode that and, uh, by the noisy channel that garbles that. Decoding is uh, basically look, trans searching a space, because the word alignments uh, are leveraged to build a space uh, for a search algorithm, uh, translating searching into a space of options. Okay? So uh, once we build our knowledge base on probabilistic, uh, we like uh, establish a graph, uh, links between words, uh, and we try to uh, walk this graph following only the promising paths in our graph, which are weighted with our probability laws. So, for example, if we have the, region, the foreign sentence, Maria no daba una bofetada alla bruja verde, uh, then we have, uh, in our knowledge base that we've built the alignments, uh, we know that uh, Maria aligns with Mary, because if so, that every time there's a Maria, 100% uh, of times there is Mary. Uh, no, may align with not, did not, no, or didn't give, but only when uh, no is also with no daba. This aligns with the two words. So each one of these options is tagged with a probability that we uh, computed by observing our parallel data. So each one has a probability in it. So when we decode, the algorithm builds the search space as a tree of options. So each time we make a choice, we leave all the choices on our back, and we have new choices with the narrower uh, number, number of uh, possibilities to explore. It's a tree option which is sorted by the probability that we computed before. Search space is limited to a fixed size, which is named beam, so that we don't get a com uh, uh, exponential uh, combinations, but we only prune it to a fixed number to keep memory usage low. Each option is picked on the highest probability first. Reordering of words adds a penalty because the language model penalizes each stage's output. So you basically generate the combinations of words, then you have it to uh, evaluate on language model, which says, uh, OK, these words in this order are OK, but these other words, you uh, actually flip them, so it is not something they observe in usual English. This, um, this sentence is unnatural. I'm penalizing it uh, by apply a discount on your probability. Translation stops when all source words are translated or covered so, we start with an empty uh, stack with probability one, so the maximum possible. Uh, then we explore the options. We may begin uh, by assigning Mary because it's very high probabilities, 53%, 0 0.53 is 53%. Then may, we may try to start with which, but which has a lower probability of being there, so we try to go the direction. We then uh, try to cover Mary did not. Uh, we try to fill all those uh, uh, empty spaces like we, we play the Hanged Man uh, game, you know? And uh, the more you go, the, pro the lesser the probability grows, actually, because uh, you are uh, multiplying numbers under 0. So 0, 1 times uh, 0, 5 makes 0, 0, 5. So the probability is always lesser and lesser and lesser. But if we try to pick up always the highest ranking probability that the language model evaluates at each stage, uh, if you don't make any mistake, uh, it uh, times one, because it's 100% okay for me. When you end up covering all the space uh, of uh, hyphens, uh, you will have uh, a complete sentence. The translation is over. You can output your uh, thing. So that was uh, how we did things in the past. Uh, we did this, this state of things. Uh, uh, lasted until uh, 2016, I, I'd say. Google really, uh, th this technique was pioneered uh, in uh, Italy, in uh, Germany, and uh, in um, Edinburgh. The University of Edinburgh had really, really good scientists. Philip Cohen 
uh, build this thing. Uh, we had the University of Trento in Italy that was a really uh, diamond uh, in this uh, field. But then things change. Uh, then this, uh, we, we know what happened. Uh, more power, lots of it available. Uh, this model uh, is actually very promising, so let's try to experiment with this one. And uh, we got the neural machine translation, which really started uh, uh, kicking in in 2016 on. The neural machine translation is based on the probability too, but there's some differences uh, compared to the statistical machine translation. First of all, it's an end-to-end -end system. It's just one system that uh, evaluates, aligns, and translates uh, all together. We don't have uh, two separate uh, like translation model and the language model that builds two systems that uh, weight uh, the quality. And we have then a third system, which is the decoder, that which pulls these two models. We just have one. This is much better because uh, Translation model and language model are not trained at the same time, so they are just two systems that we try to make collaborate. We try to build an ensemble, but it's not, they, are, they don't share any knowledge, so most of the times they disagree. Uh, this process is inefficient. Uh, they tend to have different opinions about the same thing, even though they were um, trained on the same data. Instead, here we have just one system who holds all the knowledge, uh, global, and uh, it's uh, much more efficient. And uh, second, uh, more important, uh, the Markovian assumption, uh, instead of naive Bayesian, the theorem, theorem of bias uh, established that a probability can be fa uh, of a system, uh, of an uh, event occurring, can be factored in the single components, uh, because we know that uh, the probability of raining uh, is, uh, depends uh, on uh, how much sun, how many clouds, uh, the humidity, the period of the year, Many factors together concur to, is it going to rain tomorrow or not? So this, uh, uh, the Bayesian system uh, does a, a naive assumption that all these uh, factors are independent and makes the problem very tractable, very simple. So we try to examine all the different factors uh, separately. But with words, it uh, doesn't work really well because words don't move independently. If I'm going to say, I am going, am is dependent of the fact that there was an I before. And so you cannot really say that uh, I translate to with the io and uh, m uh, is sto. Why not sto or sono, uh, which is, means stay, I'm here. So it does a Markovian assumption. Each word uh, has, uh, is hardly linked with the history of the everything which precedes. So uh, in mathematical terms, that means that is a sentence f of length uh, n is a sequence of words, w1, w2, w3, wn. The probability of the sentence can be modeled as the probability of having a sequence of words. And uh, it makes uh, this symbol is a product, is a product of uh, the probability of having a certain words uh, uh, combined, conditioned by the fact, uh, biased by the fact that uh, we observed a full history of words coming before. This is called uh, Conditional probability. So uh, how we, can we fit this uh, in neural networks? Uh, how many of people here don't know neural networks? Uh, raise your hand if you don't know what is a neural network. Uh, come on, don't be shy. Come on, come on, come on, come on. OK. So basically, ne neural networks uh, is an ensemble of very small units called neurons. These neurons uh, are linked together in uh, batteries. Uh, and uh, these links are weighted and determine the strength uh, a neuron can influence its neighbor. If you have a strong uh, influence on the opposite, on the, um, the neighbor which are in front of me, by providing an input into these neurons, uh, I will be able to pump them in uh, uh, taking a decision based on what sh which neuron says. And these neurons, in turn, can influence other neurons uh, until you get to the final stage. Uh, and each final neuron is uh, one single class. So if I have uh, uh, a neuron that says this is white or this is black, uh, just one of them will fire up uh, in case I want to say this one or this other. This is a feed-forward network. Uh, and basically, when you uh, are training, you feed uh, training data as input, uh, and you compare the output you get to the expected output. The deviation between the expected output is used as a, a penalization to rebalance all the weights in the network going backward. 
But a feed-forward network is not suitable to map the, temporary, the temporal dependencies between words, because uh, M has a link to the fact that it was uh, preceded by I. And going, uh, of course, uh, has a, a bound to the I M, which uh, we saw before. So we need an architecture that can explicitly map sequences of words, not all together. This is like stateless, all the input coming together at the same time, and then producing an output because we observed the full third as an input. So we need something which is able to actually take care of evaluating step by step when we see words one by one. And this model exists, it's a recurrent network. A recurrent network is just a, a very simple network in which we have just one neuron. We feed the input one piece at a time, and the network influences itself step by step. But since this way of depicting it is really, really hard to, uh, to figure out in mind, we prefer to unroll the network the times the number of steps that we have. So if we have 10 words, we unroll it 10 times. Each time we, we feed the network at each time step one different input. So the first would be I, the second would be M, the third one would be going. And each time, at each step, you are not only influenced by the word you are seeing, but also from the history which is, uh, has been injected to you at each time step. Please note that the, the, um, the weight we have in all the different uh, time step uh, is always the same. It's always the same neuron that we copy, and we uh, have it to be influenced by all the time steps. This is very good uh, to model, uh, to build a language model, because uh, uh, if we can map the relationship between between words, uh, we can then use it to estimate uh, what will be the most probable word that will uh, be generated, uh, given the fact that we saw this history. So we start with an empty state, and um, starting with an empty token, uh, what is the most probable word that's going to be produced, uh, given the fact that I'm at the beginning of the sentence? Uh, and it's going to produce uh, a word, the W1, which may be and. So this, uh, this language model thinks that uh, if you are at the beginning of the sentence, you're going to see all the sentences uh, beginning with and. So given the fact that I just uh, begun my sentence, that I saw and, uh, which is right here. I have the laser pointer? Oh, yes. Very sweet. So given the fact that I have uh, seen the beginning of the sentence and I have and, uh, what is the, the highest uh, pro uh, probability ranking word that will be produced? The word the, W2, that in this case is here. So given the fact that I saw the and 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 beginning and uh, how do you map the history? This is because this connection. So all of these uh, things are going to influence each step. So if I have, uh, uh, how is it going? And I have to estimate uh, uh, how likely is it to be. If I put uh, a special token, which is the end of the sentence, uh, and uh, I put a sentence that I've generated into my langu narrow language model, I can, if I get to see the end token, that validates the fact that sentence is complete and well-formed. Instead, if I see some other word, or the, my language model try to predict a word which has nothing to do with the sentence I'm trying to fit it, it means that my sentence is not really that good. So this is a way we build a probability model over a just one language that we take as a source. Going to our translation model, the narrow translation model, we rely on uh, an architecture which is called encoder-decoder. The encoder-decoder is an ensemble of two different neural networks that collaborate together, one uh, trans uh, transforming uh, an input sentence into an intermediate space of knowledge which only the neural network uh, understands, and then this intermediate space is passed as an input to the second network which uses that knowledge to build the final representation we are seeking. So with the sentence uh, F given, uh, made by these uh, tokens and, uh, and uh, a sentence E, which is our label, that's why we use the Y, we are looking for the sentence E, which maximizes the probability of having a sentence E output uh, given the fact that we saw the sentence F in a language we don't know. So we want to have the highest probability scoring uh, bag of tokens, sequence of words, not a bag, is a sequence actually, because the order matters, uh, given the fact that we observed uh, a foreign sentence. Uh, 
This means that at a certain stage, uh, we will be computing the probability of having these next words outputted, uh, given the fact that we have seen this history of words uh, in the target language of outputs, uh, given the fact also that we, were, we started with a foreign sentence. Uh, this maps everything as a one single sequence uh, in which uh, the, uh, a cert any certain point of the computation, uh, the next target word in our language that we are putting uh, has been influenced by the history of the output, uh, but also the history of the input. Uh, that's OK. It works, but it's very cumbersome because uh, it means that we have to build uh, uh, just one single uh, recurrent network, which is very complex and very long. Instead, why don't we exploit the fact that we are actually dealing with two different languages uh, that uh, uh, have really no ties, which because uh, two different languages don't share vocabulary. They have uh, two different uh, vocabularies. Sorry, OK. Uh, and uh, we separate them in two separate uh, uh, recurrent networks. So we then first build uh, with uh, a model based on the input uh, sentence, uh, and we build uh, a vector h. This vector is a summary vector of the source. It represents uh, in a vectorial form, so a sequence of uh, floating point numbers, uh, how uh, my network judges this sentence. Then we try to output a sequence of words in my language, given the history of what I have put it so far. Of course, if I am on step number one, this history will be empty. But more important, given the fact that I observed this state. So when we have a trained network, we, uh, if we have a, a network to be trained, I start with random weights. And then I influence my network with the input sentences and I have this state. Then I'm starting to influence the output network uh, given the state, the intermediate state. This is uh, how an encoder-decoder network, uh, which is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence network, uh, works. So we start, uh, uh, sorry for the, this, it's censoring basically uh, my thing. It was uh, the waiter took the place. That was uh, the hidden thing. I curse you, Mac OS. Uh, which is uh, influencing my network one step at a time. And when it gets to the end, uh, this uh, summary vector, which has seen as witness at all the tokens, uh, is passed to uh, the G network. Uh, the G network starts outputting its first token, given the fact that it has seen all of this thing that summarizes all this knowledge, and starts IL, uh, which is the. So, and then passes the state, uh, given the fact that I've seen IL, and given the fact that I come from here, from this. Uh, state, which is linked here and passed it here, what am I supposed to generate? Come here, which is the waiter, and then on and on and on and on until you output uh, uh, the last words, and then the network refuses to go further. It just outputs end over, over, over. I I'm done. Hey, please don't cycle anymore. And that's basically how a narrow machine translation works. And uh, this actually was, uh, this model was invented in 2014. So all of this is really, really near in time. The problem is the, with the summary vector is that the, it constitutes an information bottleneck. Fixed side representation degrades as uh, sentence length increases. So this is because uh, the alignment learns, uh, learning uh, operates on many-to-many -many logic. When we learn, uh, we get uh, the, uh, the difference between the, out the output uh, and uh, of uh, our network and expect the output, we compute a loss and we propagate that uh, in a backward fashion. The difference is called uh, the gradient that flows backward. The problem is that uh, what if, I, for example, I got wrong only this uh, E? Then uh, my output would be different. Uh, all the network will be punished uh, just for this one. So I will change the weight also for this uh, bounds. Uh, even the took was uh, currently aligned with Preze and waiter was currently aligned with Kamehye. Just for this error, I will punish the full network. This is not fair. It's really inefficient, actually. So it would be much better if uh, only this one was punished for generating this one. How we can do that? We can put some uh, gates. Uh, like uh, in water management, the, the dams. We put some dams uh, that uh, gate the gradient flow backward uh, through a context vector, which is like a mask of uh, windows that open and close. Uh, and uh, 
it basically constitutes a, a weighted average of the source states. This is called soft search, also it's called attention model. So what we have here is that instead of passing the full state, we just pass an average sum here. So if I have to generate the word ill, I weight the with 0, 7, and all the rest really matters not that much. So the the will be the one that will be influencing ill. And if we have to generate the camille, wager is the one that has to wait. All, all these weights are learned through the process, actually. And so on, and on, and on, and all the uh, all single words. So if this one gets wrong, uh, when the gradient flows back, it uh, changes all the weights uh, in order to improve uh, the performance of my network, uh, this one will be punished most uh, for uh, saying uh, a stupid thing. This one will get punished, but only proportional to this weight. So the punishment is diminished, and the alignment that correctly predicted these things uh, will actually be uh, kept, because it was good. That's OK. Now you know basically everything that needs to be known uh, on the ba uh, base level to build a narrow machine translation. What can we do in this final uh, minutes that we've been left? For example, sometimes we want our network to assume a particular style, but we don't have enough. So for example, I want my network to translate a document uh, using legalese lingo. Have you ever read the contract, uh, one written by notaries, like terms of service? I'm sure you all did, and it's unreadable, but it's actually written in a very specific language. I want to translate uh, legalist documents. You say, well, why uh, don't you just get 100,000 documents you train a machine translation that uh, speaks legalese? I don't have that much data. I have uh, a lot of data instead uh, to train it uh, on common language. So a strategy can be to adapt an array trained network. First, I train a full network with general data to obtain a general model which is able to translate uh, about everything. Then we train the last layers uh, on new data. So we train, uh, we give the legalist data over the network, but then I, kept, I keep all these weights fixed. And so all, I leave, uh, all, all this can change, actually. So these last layers uh, are uh, trained on very few data compared to the bigger training set. Uh, and, uh, this is the one that changes. The effect is that I transfer most of my learning that occur here. It's inherited here as a starting point. And then it's uh, fine-tuned with my trained data, which is uh, much less. This uh, is exploited by one single framework, uh, which is called Modern MT. And uh, I uh, take pride in, in uh, having been one of uh, the teams in the, the build the first prototype. It's an Italian invention, and uh, we did this in Rome uh, at the Picampus. So it was, uh, and it's all free, open source. You go to Modern MT uh, and you, on GitHub, and you download the, the thing and can start translating. Uh, can we do better than this? Of course, uh, those genius folks of Google uh, built uh, a thing which is uh, capable of zero-shot translation. What does it mean? What if we, we can translate uh, from French to German because we have a lot of examples? We can translate from English to Italian because we have a lot of examples. What if we don't have any training examples, any align of uh, parallel corpus uh, for English to German? In the past, what we did was uh, to avoid uh, building uh, uh, for nine language pair 72 models, uh, the combinatorial uh, explosion. Uh, we trained eight models, and then we used English as a pivotal language. So for example, I want to translate from uh, German to Spanish, but I don't have enough data. But I have always a lot of data from and to English. So I trained two models, English to uh, German to English, and then the output is uh, sent to another translator, English to Spanish. You can imagine the results. The distortion was so bad that it was basically uh, not usable. So most of the times, you end up just translated to, towards English, and you read with your knowledge of the English in your mind. Neural uh, machine uh, learning is capable to overcome this. How we do that? We, oops. Stop before it rings. We send all the data into one single system, but we prepend the token. So when we have to train from French to German, we prepend two German, je suis ici, and then the network is supposed to output ich bin hier. If we're to translate English to Italian, we say towards Italian, I am here, 
and then sono qui. When we want to send English to German, we say, to the I am here. And you know what? The single system will output Ich bin here. What is the magic? The magic is that uh, uh, we sent so many times to the output German, to the output German, then uh, when the network sees a true D, it prepares itself to output a German sentence. It's like a Pavlovian association. When uh, it sees this, it already knows that you're it has to activate neurons which relates to German language. It's really fascinating because it really resembles the brain. When you have to switch uh, your brain in forming a sentence already in English, when you have to think in English. And uh, as a side effect, we, so we build an internal shared knowledge representation among, uh, between the languages. And this enables to translate between unseen language pairs. So we saw English language, we saw German language, and we can really translate even though we have no parallel data between English to German. That's a very, very big feat. Can we do even better than this? Yes, we can. What if I told you you can train a machine translation without parallel data? Without parallel data. Can we do this? Yes, we can. This is the last frontier, the final frontier. And uh, this was a paper which I saw this autumn, the autumn of 2017. So what we do, we use just the two more lingual corpora. So I take Wikipedia in Italian, Wikipedia in English, unrelated articles. I don't need to have a bond between articles. Each corpus builds a latent semantic space. So I build a network that from source sentences is capable to build a latent space in which we have a very compression representation of this sentence. And I can go back to the same or something really similar words. I can generate a noisy representation and then denoise it. This is called an autoencoder. The trick is that similar languages, for example, the English, French, uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Italian have uh, similar grammars and similar semantic bonds. So they tend to build a similar latent space. And I can map a uh, latent space to another, using an encoder to uh, bring myself into the intermediate space, and using the decoder of a, the target language to get out of this space and getting out in a different language. So translation now is a geometrical mapping between a thin Latin semantic spaces. So it's an isomorphism between two uh, spaces which share the same characteristics but have the different objects. And uh, this is uh, it for today. I leave with some links. Uh, you can get the, um, the slides. Uh, it will be published on the, on the website, of course. This uh, uh, stuff that pertains to the Google uh, stuff. Also, Amazon build, built a sequence-to-sequence -sequence framework, which is based on MXNet, which is the TensorFlow of Amazon. And this uh, website, which gathers all the material for the very old school uh, stuff, it was very fascinating. One last thing, we are hiring at SourceSense, uh, not only DevOps, but I, I left that because the joke was great. Uh, but also we uh, hire coders uh, and uh, data scientists. That's it. Uh, thanks for your attention.